Lewis told me there were secret passages, but I never believed him. Turns out, my mom was really good at keeping secrets. Now it was time to find out what my mom had been afraid of. I played this just over a year ago, and I have thought about it pretty much every day since. These were the first words that I ever heard about the game What Remains of Edith Finch. I was watching PlayStation Access's Friday feature on a slow Saturday at work when I came across a video called Seven Games So Powerful That You Won't Ever Be The Same Afterwards. We're about to get serious. And the first entry was Edith Finch which I'll have a link to that in the description. I had never even heard of the game at that point. I had only gotten a PlayStation 4 about a year prior, so I was a little late to the party, and I didn't know much about what was even out there. But something about this 4 minute entry in a list video had me captivated. I really wanted to know more. The idea of learning more about a large family that had all met terrible ends resonated. Edie said she dreamed about the old house every night. See, I was dealing with depression and really struggling mentally for anything that felt like it had meaning. And somehow I felt like this game would help me, which, even saying now, feels really cheesy. The thing is, I just kept thinking about that opening line. A game that had such power to stick in someone's mind for so long, especially someone who tackles as many games as Rob. I had to check it out for myself. I have been swayed by Robert's case for the game being powerful, and while it may seem like I'm gushing over PlayStation Access, or at least Robert Pearson's work, it's because this video led me to one of my favorite video games that I have ever played, and one that has had a profound impact on me. See, my mother was the youngest of 11 children, so the idea of being part of a big family really caught my interest. I used to love hearing different stories from my family, learning about our history, but Sadly, I never did get to hear nearly as much about our family history as I wanted. Maybe we believed so much in a family curse, we made it real. So the premise of someone going back to relive the important moments of their family was absolutely captivating. Even if the idea of the moments being how they died felt really morbid. The truth is, I don't think that I would have ever had any interest in this game on my own. But I had come to trust Rob's opinions on games. See, he's an RPG guy like I am, and he grew up with some of the same favorites as me. So I knew that it had to be at least a decent game, and even if I didn't like it, it was only a few hours long so I wouldn't be losing a lot of time to it. So I picked it up on Steam and I gave it a go, and I am so, so glad that I did. Now, I've been torn about making this video because I did make a video some years ago looking at this game, but it just wasn't something I'm really proud of. It may be a precursor, though, for me to some of the content that I make now, which is why I decided I wanted to try it again. With other videos that I've made, I've had more of an outline in my head before I even started. But with this one, I'm just going to start writing and we'll see where it goes. Just the same as Edith did on her journey back through her family home. I want to uncover more about this game as I make the video, and hopefully uncover more about myself and why this game means so much to me. So please join me in exploring the Finch House as we look through the history of one of the most cursed families in video game history. I'm the Unhinged Gamer, and this is my What Remains of Edith Finch Retrospective. What Remains of Edith Finch, first and foremost, is a narrative-driven game. If you really want to boil it down to its base mechanics, it's a series of mini-games that barely would qualify as games at all, tied together with a captivating narrative. And I know that doesn't sound like much fun, or anything that's very impressive, but this game is absolutely more than the sum of its parts. The gameplay is simple falling easily into the category of titles deemed walking sims, which are games that don't really have much, if any, game to them. 
but the purpose of this game is to tell a story, and they use every element of the game to tell the narrative. Molly always seemed like a girl I could imagine being friends with if she hadn't died in 1947. This was the second game released from developer Giant Sparrow, which sadly, it's also the last game that they've released to date, even though their website does say that they have another game in development. Despite having only two titles out, they have gained a reputation for producing high quality and unique games. Their first game, The Unfinished Swan, focused on using paint to uncover an entire world hidden in a blank canvas as you uncover the story of the world that you're in. I actually recorded a Let's Play for that game a couple years ago on the channel, and while you know, my ability to do Let's Plays is really lacking, it is still up if anyone has any interest in checking it out. And while I'm definitely not much of a Let's Player, I will say that the game is absolutely incredible. The development for Edith Finch began sometime in 2013. The creative director, Ian Dallas, has said that the concepts for the game was to create an interactive experience that evokes what it feels like to have a moment of finding something beautiful yet overwhelming. And the team certainly achieved that here. The development team settled on the idea of multiple smaller stories all tied into a larger narrative where all the stories come together to provide a timeline of events. It's such a simple concept and led to the game's entire premise being a very cinematic experience. The team had experimented with a bunch of different ideas before falling on the premise of basing it all around one cursed family. The early trailer for the game had a much darker tone to it, giving almost a horror or suspense feel to the video. However, they thankfully shifted gears before the final product came to light. The game was originally set to be published by Santa Monica Studio, as Giant Sparrow was partnered with Sony. But when Sony started to get cold feet on supporting independently developed games, they ended up dropped from the Santa Monica Studio lineup. This actually worked in their favor as it gave the team more time to further refine the game, and it led to the addition of two of the most impactful sections of the game being refined into something really special. They were also able to get picked up by the newly formed Annapurna Interactive, which published a game for them. Maybe it'd be better if all this just died with me. But I thought you should know about your family. And the history you're a part of. When Edith Finch finally released in 2017, it received widespread critical acclaim. The game also won a decent amount of awards, mostly awards focused on the narrative as well as a ton of other nominations. The narrative focus on this game was definitely key, with a story strong enough that even the simplest aspects of the game wound up feeling charming as a result. The only reason to ever not finish this game would be if you for some reason didn't enjoy the narrative and just turned it off, because there's really no challenge or difficulty to speak of. The game has gone on to be released on every major platform now, even being released again in 2022 for the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X and S. For this video, I chose to capture my footage on my PC version, as I've got it for the PC, Switch, and PS4 already. So with all that out of the way, I think it's time that we dive in and see just what makes What Remains of Edith Finch such a special title. The game opens up on the back of a boat. You're a passenger heading out to Orcas Island to visit your family home. The scene is pretty peaceful and you can see the logo slowly shrinking as you move away from it. Now after looking down, you'll realize that the main character has his hand in a cast and is holding a book. It's a journal that simply has Edith Finch written on it. Now as you turn the pages, you hear the voice of Edith narrating the story. I'm just gonna start at the beginning with the house. From there it fades as we're taken into the game. You then find yourself standing on a long driveway in the forest. You're now in control of Edith. Now she's revisiting her family home having left years ago, although we don't know what caused her to initially leave. 
The shift into the story of the journal is a sign of what's to come as the game will jump into stories about the various members of the Finch family. Edith is here because her mother passed away and left her with a key. In her will, my mother left me a key but didn't tell me what it unlocked. Maybe she thought I'd know, or she thought that the mystery would be enough to bring me back. She inherited the family home, or at least what's remaining of it, as the last remaining Finch. We learned that the family was considered to be cursed, as each member had died in wild and mysterious circumstances. A very eclectic group of people who were clearly very close. The driveway is in disrepair, with a fence blocking the passage. There's still posters strewn about searching for Edith's brother Milton, who had went missing and was never found. Aside from the missing posters, it's a very calm setting, and as you move closer to the home, the atmosphere of the world that you're in tells the story in so many small ways. The house was exactly like I remembered it, the way I'd been dreaming about it. Your first view of the house is breathtaking, seeing this massive, strange monolith of a home jutting up from the hillside near the shore. It immediately sets the tone for everything that's to come. The trek towards the house is so calm, it's almost unnerving how quiet it is, feeling like nobody had set foot here in years. The land had gotten accustomed to the silence. The narrative style with the words from the journal arriving on the screen is a really nice way to let us know what's going through Edith's mind. The simple art direction for this game makes it one of my favorite settings that I've ever experienced. The thing is, it's also normal. But something makes it off like it's too normal, if that even makes sense. The house itself is an intimidating structure and serves as its own important character to the story of the game. Now there's a pond with a collapsed wooden dragon slide next to the house, and when you go to investigate it, you're given a good idea of just what kind of people you're dealing with. I asked Edie once about the dragon in the pond. She said it had killed her husband. I was six. It seemed like an odd joke to me even then. Even if you don't investigate the pond, you'll get a glimpse into the family as soon as you try the door, as Edith's not even surprised that the key that her mom gave her doesn't work for the front door. This forces her to head around and in through the doggy door of the garage to get inside. The garage itself looks like it could be anyone's garage. There's nothing special about it and nothing to make it stand out, really. And it looks lived in. But it's clear that being here is already starting to flood Edith with emotions. Her thoughts and feelings being shared as she moves into the house. For the first time in years, I felt like I was home. Edith heads out of the garage and into the kitchen. It looks like the family had maybe left for an afternoon, not for seven years. There's a picture of Edith with her mom, her great-grandma Edie, and her oldest brother Louis on the refrigerator, next to an announcement for her brother Louis's funeral. Apparently, they left shortly after the funeral. And after reminiscing on that night, you can explore more of the house. The table was still a wreck from the night we left. It was like a bomb had gone off, killing everyone but sparing the furniture. The atmospheric storytelling here is strong. Before we even get into any of the stories, you can see pictures of Barbara Finch next to a music box that her father Sven had made for her, as well as other pictures of the family and their interests all over the house as well as walls that are lined, as well as floors, and pretty much everywhere you look, there's just books all over. As you head up the stairs, you learn that Edith's mother, Dawn, had sealed most of the doors to the house, and that her grandmother didn't really appreciate it. After Milton disappeared, Mom sealed up all the bedrooms. Then Edie retaliated and drilled peepholes. The peepholes allow you to peek into the rooms and get a glimpse of what's inside. 
All the other rooms are sealed, but one. Walter's room. And it's here that we finally figure out what the key was for. Opening a hidden door that cracks the story wide open. Reading this, maybe it sounds like I had a plan. But I had no idea what was behind that door. Edith makes her way through the small passageway until she comes out in Molly's room. The rooms here are all preserved just as they were when their occupants were still living. Edie did a wonderful job of preserving them. There's a journal entry on the desk from Molly, and when Edith starts to read it, we're thrust right into Molly's story. Dear Diary, I'll be gone soon, but I wanted to tell somebody about what's going to happen. It started when Mom sent me to bed without dinner. Molly had been sent to bed without dinner. We don't know why, but we do get a possible hint when she looks at her empty Halloween candy bowl. But anyways, the girl eats anything she can find, even pondering her fish Christopher. It's a little awkward seeing her eating toothpaste and the berries from the holly in the window. But then, when she sees a bird outside... I was a cat! Yeah, now we know exactly what kind of game this is. We're inside the imagination of a young girl. It's really cool to bounce around from branch to branch as a cat chasing after a bird. And just when you think you understand this story... And suddenly, I was an owl. Yeah, so now we're an owl and we're flying around hunting for rabbits. It's a really cool bit of imaginative gameplay here. Watching an owl scarfing down whole rabbits is amusing enough, but if things couldn't get any more amusing... And suddenly, I was a shark! I laughed my ass off the first time I saw this clip. A random cut to a shark falling out of a tree was the last thing I was expecting. But, after the shark, you end up on a ship as a monster, wiping out the entire crew before things go full circle as this creature lurks its way back up the shore, up a pipe, and into the house. Now, of course, a monster didn't really eat Molly. Her actual death isn't known, but this journal entry is part of the legend of the family curse. Edith marks it in her journal before heading out the window. And I think it does say a little bit about Edith herself that some of the exploration she does here, like just crawling out a window, feels natural to her, like there's nothing weird going on. The house, for as massive as it is, is a linear story. The sealed doors and various hidden passages make this game feel natural, despite being a clearly intentionally crafted experience. Moving all over the home reminds me of being a kid, exploring and climbing, crawling, learning about the places that I grew up in, exploring the woods around my grandma's house, or the small town that I grew up. There's a childlike wonder to the exploration between these scenes. The next room that we get into is Grandma Edie's room. Inside here, we get to see a glimpse into the mind of the family's matriarch. She's got pictures, news articles, so many different things scattered around this room. I could only imagine how long you could spend in a place like this just going through the drawers to see what all's there. But just from the little glance that we get, you can clearly see how eccentric Edie was. She has an old viewfinder toy that shows the story of her family's tragic journey to Orcas Island and the sinking of the original Finch home that was built by her father. And the idea of him floating a home across the sea anyways is crazy enough. But I remember playing with several of these toys like this growing up, so this bit of nostalgia really brought me back to my childhood. And the cluttered room? My own grandma's room was full of so much stuff like this. Things that she kept that meant a little something to her. So it's not hard for me to feel a little bit at home here, and a little bit overwhelming seeing just how much Edie made me miss my grandma. When Edie told people Sven was killed by a dragon, she could also have said he was building a dragon-shaped slide that collapsed. She could have, but she didn't. There's just so many quirks about Grandma Edie that there's no way to describe it really, 
but you could feel like you know someone in your family like her. Or at least I do, which could say something about me and my family. One summer, they evacuated the island, but Edie refused to go. For a few weeks, she was a celebrity. After exploring her room, we head into the bathroom, and it is very pink. The shag carpet on the floor was a little bit disturbing, but I also know family members who had carpet in their bathrooms, and one of the homes that we grew up in when I was younger had a big shaggy carpet on the floor, and it took a lot of getting used to and a lot of constant cleaning to maintain that. The room was designed by Edith Grandpa Sam's first wife, and it's hard to look at or even be in. Thankfully, there's a secret door behind the toilet leading to a small makeshift dark room that's set up by Sam. He was an avid photographer, and this little dark room gives us a small glimpse into the kind of things that he was into. We then make our way out of the dark room and into Sam's room, which is probably the most unique room in the main part of the house at this point. And as we learn from Edith, Sam's twin brother Calvin was captivated by flying and space, and as Edith explores the room, she finds a short story that Sam wrote about his brother. How I Want to Remember My Brother by Sam Finch. The thing I remember is that when he made up his mind, that was it. We're then taken to a scene of Calvin on a swing. It's the same swing that we saw through the peephole in the fence on our way just inside the house. Now, the game mechanics here are pretty simple. You use the controller to manipulate both of his feet individually to swing and build up momentum. Now, as a kid, I used to daydream about being able to take the swing over the top. I think a lot of kids grew up with that thought. If only I could get high enough, I could make it. Of course, I mean, it's a terrible idea as we see here, but the idea of swinging higher and higher made something extremely simple feel like something extremely special. And as the swing goes higher, I could feel the tension building in my shoulders just as it would if I was actually swinging. The story itself is beautiful in its sadness. Sam clearly loved his brother. Calvin was his twin. There's always a sibling bond, but they grew up very close. And Sam's closing words about his brother were as heartwarming as they were painful. That's what I want to remember about my brother. The day he made up his mind to fly, and he did. Edith then heads out of the room, making her way through another hidden passage. And from there, you can get out into the main house again. But the real destination is the family celebrity. We're making our way into Barbara's room. We learn that Barbara was a popular child actress, known for her scream. Her room is decked out in things from her time in the spotlight. But even then, her work outfit shows that her career fizzled out. And as you're exploring, we reach another story that's even more unique than anything that we've experienced yet. Of all the stories people wrote about Barbara's death, I'm surprised Edie saved this one. It's a comic book, taking pages from Tales of the Crypt for inspiration. The comic tells a story about Barbara and her attempt to reclaim her fame. Her plans are ruined when her father Sven injures himself in the basement. She has to lose her big second chance to go babysit her brother Walter. A deranged hookman invades the home, and after she dispatches the hookman, he vanishes and the monsters from the big convention that she was supposed to go to arrive. And then they unalive her. The story is morbid and the 3D cell shaded comic book style is visually stunning. I love this change up and the story was so twisted. Again, Edith is a bit unnerved that this story was the one that Edie chose to keep. 
saying that several stories were told about Barbara over the years. It's a wild story, and as much as the story speaks to the disturbing nature of Barbara's death, the inclusion of this comic also speaks volumes about Grandma Edie's personality. But now, through the comic book, we learn that Sven had used the music box by the basement door as a trick to hide the basement key. And the fact that it proves to be true just makes the story even more disturbing. You have to wonder how much more the story in the comic is accurate. I mean, the game is rooted in reality, but there are still a lot of fantasy elements in the storytelling. Now we try the key to the basement and we head downstairs. Edith says that she's seen Edie heading down in the basement with packages before, and now we find out that the basement has its own fallout bunker, where Walter had been living for years. Now his story is a very simple one. Goodbye, everyone. I can't believe I've been down here for 30 years. From a player perspective, you're turning a can opener each day to eat a can of peaches. We learn that Walter has suffered badly from PTSD and God knows what else, having been there the night that Barbara was ended. He's been so afraid, believing that a monster is out there trying to get him, and as a result has lived most of his life in a bunker in the basement. His mother Edie was bringing supplies down to the bunker for him, and he was trapped essentially living the same day, year after year. There's a loud rumbling nearby, and Walter, in his damaged mind, believes that it's something out there after him. But after a time with no tremors, he finally decides that enough is enough and leaves. It's a bit crazy that he didn't just head out the door back into the house, but Walter also allegedly witnessed his sister's end inside of that house, so I can kind of understand him not wanting to go back inside. His story does remind me. In Edie's room, we learned that she told a story to the press about a mole man living under the Finch home. Edie gave a big interview about a mole man living under the Finch house. My mom was furious. And knowing now about Walter makes that story a bit more disgusting. Her story was literally about her own son, and given the title, it could not have been a complimentary article. Anyways... Walter breaks out through a wall into a train tunnel. From here, he slowly makes his way out of the tunnel, reflecting on his life and his family, deciding that he wants to live. And it's a very ironic end. He finally decides to move on with his life, and as he turns the corner, he lifts his eyes to the sun just as a train is coming at him. I can already imagine the sun on my face. Again, this is another story. There's no certificate or anything to prove that this is exactly how he died. But there's enough that this one really feels plausible. I mean, we literally leave through the hole that Walter put into the train tunnel. After leaving, Edith heads out the same way that her great uncle Walter went. There... She reflects on the family curse, on all of the death and her own doubts about this visit and this journal. The entire journal is Edith telling the legend of her family curse in so many different ways. And it's a fantastic story that could easily be forgotten by time. And I can understand wondering if it should be. That history of imagination and stubbornness and madness, any of it seems possible. It's a story about tragedy, but also importantly, it's her family story. It's their legacy. What kind of family finishes building a cemetery before starting the house? Edith then enters the family cemetery, and it was apparently built before the house and designed by Edie herself. There's little touches to show the personalities of each family member here, and Edie has a monument as a focal point that's dedicated to her father, Odin showing the importance that Edie has to preserving the memories and honoring her family. There's only one detail in the cemetery that really doesn't sit well with me. Propped up against the stone for Gus is a pinwheel, which of course is an item made all about wind, and we'll get to why I feel like this is in poor taste soon enough. 
As Edith leaves the cemetery and heads deeper into the family home, we get another revelation. But looking back on it now, if she told me there was going to be so much climbing, I never would have come when I was 22 weeks pregnant. During this visit to the family home, Edith is very pregnant. If it wasn't clear before then, this entire visit is being documented for her to give to her unborn child. That's why she's preserving these memories. She and her child are the last two of the Finch family. The trip leads her onto the roof since the third floor entrance was locked inside. We now find ourselves part of the added section to the house. This family never considered building out on the house as they grew. There was never a plan to repurpose the rooms for future generations. As the family grew, they built up. So now we're in an addition that's likely built by Edie's grandfather, Sam. This addition was built for Sam and his children and has a more modern look than most of the main house. Inside, we first come across Sam's adult room. It's clear that Sam was an outdoorsman. The room shows that he served in the military and has won his fair share of medals. Now, when we dive into his story, we're taken on a hunting trip that he went on with his daughter, Dawn. Dawn, I promise you'll never forget this weekend. Yes, sir. These memories are going to last a lifetime. Mm -hmm. As we saw earlier on, Sam is an avid photographer and he's passing on that love to his daughter on this trip. The story is told through the pictures that are taken. Sam teaches Dawn to hunt and to use a gun, and the trip seems pretty traumatic to the girl, and that's before the curse strikes again. See, the deer that Dawn shot wasn't dead, and it knocked Sam off the cliff to his death as they were posing for a picture on a timer. I can't even begin to imagine how that impacted Dawn, seeing her father die right in front of her, and she'd already lost both of her brothers by this point. It's a tragic scene, and with that, the last of Great Grandma Edie's offspring has passed on. Of all these stories, that's the one I wish most that my mom had told me. Edith then heads through a narrow passage into the next room, where her mother shared a bedroom with both of her brothers. The room itself is one that going into this game, I had a feeling was going to be tough for me. The first of the two stories that you come across here is Gregory. And boy, this story. I know a lot of people will talk about the brilliance of Lewis's story, and the right to do so. But this is the story that hurt me the most. Gregory's story begins with a letter from Sam to his wife and it's clear that they're going through a divorce. We then jump into the story where Gregory is in a bathtub, and the end game of this one immediately hit me. Gregory is a happy baby, playing with his toys, and his mother's on the phone arguing with Sam. I dreaded every button pressed through here, and when his mom popped in and pulled the plug, I just suddenly felt relief. See, when I played through the game the first time, my youngest son was still just a baby and I couldn't help but imagine how I would feel in this situation. Maybe if I hadn't called that night. Damn it. Before his mom is able to pull him out, there's another phone call, and she takes it. Now her attention is away from Gregory, and he just wants to play. It was painful to press any buttons, knowing that everything I do is bringing us closer to the end of Gregory. But we have to keep going. Eventually, I made the final movement as the frog leapt up and turned on the water. Okay, there's so much I don't understand. From there, I was able to watch as the water flooded up and the scenario cuts to Gregory under the water. Now, I've heard people complain about the green arms saying that it was his skin turning, but it's pretty clear that this baby has a wild imagination and he's picturing himself as the toy frog. The music here is upbeat and the team did an amazing job balancing the sensitivities of their audience while laying out this scene. They are respectful to the tragedy. 
seeing Gregory circling the drain as Sam is talking to his estranged wife about how special their son is, is gut-wrenching and will forever stick in my mind. I wept the first time I played through this, sure and I still get teary-eyed even today when playing out this part of the game. And he'd want you to be happy too. Good luck, Kay. Love, Sam. From here, we get to learn about Edith's uncle Gus and his story. Who always said the wedding was a bad idea. This one is in the form of a poem written by Don about her brother. It's a really sweet letter, as well as something that reads just as honest. Gus is flying a kite on Sam's wedding day to his second wife, and he is not thrilled about this. Gus refuses to actually participate in the wedding, which is taking place in the backyard on the beach behind the house. When the time for photos came, Dad ordered him to come, come here. here. But Gus declined, and as a sign, held up his middle finger. As the poem goes, the storm picks up. Seeing the kite wiping away the words from the story is a really nice touch, and as the storm gets worse, he keeps flying the kite and it starts knocking things around in a really fantastical scene as things start to go wrong and the storm gets the better of him. Dawn's confession about forgetting about her brother shows her guilt for what happened. It's clear that Dawn feels terrible to lose another sibling, and this turned what was supposed to be a happy day into a tragedy for everyone. I mean, just imagine being Sam, losing your second child, and on your wedding day. It's a mess, and as a parent myself, these ones here stick with me. But we're nearly through the game, so we have to move forward. I wish that I could truly say I thought about you on that day. Out there on the beach alone, just you, the wind, the sea, and foam. But I didn't, until we found you. After Gus's story, we learn a little bit more about Dawn. She fled the family when she could and ended up meeting her husband Sanjay. Dawn was the first Finch to desperately try and escape the family, starting her own away from the house with her husband. But when he passed away, she was forced to return to the family home and more construction took place on the old house. The structures here are more haphazard than anything before, which helps to show the state of the family as much as it does the state of the Finch house. I feel really bad for Dawn. She wanted to be away from this place so badly. She knew the history, but when it came down to it, she didn't know where else to go. From here, we come to the castle, a structure that Edie had built as a gift for Milton. It was a place that he could let his mind roam free. He was an artist and he took full advantage of this castle that was built for him. The story told with Milton is unique in a few ways. The flip book telling the story of him vanishing was clever and it avoided another drawn out scene which makes a lot of sense as he was missing and has never been found. The other clever thing that they did here was that they managed to use Milton's story to tie into their first game, The Unfinished Swan. Placing Milton as the king from that game, who formed the world with his magical paintbrush. It's a great nod to their first video game, though I wish we had a bit more here. The castle is honestly one of the coolest rooms in the entire house. But after we learn about Milton, it's time to head up higher, making our way into a literal boat built on top of the house. This was Lewis's room, and the ode to Mary Jane is clear as can be here. Lewis's room smelled very, very familiar. That part of him lived on. The room looks like a pretty cool hangout, and Edith tells us that she spent a lot of time hanging out here with her older brother. His story is also the most talked about in the game, and for good reason. It's also the first one to outwardly address mental illness. Dear Mrs. Finch, as Lewis's psychiatrist, I can understand your desire for an explanation. As I see it, the trouble began in January, shortly after we convinced your son to seek treatment for substance abuse. Newly sober, I believe Lewis first noticed the monotony of his daily life. We're taken to Lewis's working place at the cannery. His job is simple, 
chop off the head of the fish, and send him on down the way. He seems to be good at his job despite his mind wandering. But he's constantly dreaming of another place, anywhere but his life. And he starts to craft an entire world where he is free from his mundane existence. The world he creates in his head slowly starts to consume him. We're told about this by his doctor, documenting it from her meetings with Lewis. He becomes so ingrained in his world that he starts to see it as real and his actual life as the lie. The depression overtakes him as his desire to live in this world takes priority in his life until he gives in completely and this leads to a tragic end. It's incredible that Giant Sparrow took this twist taking all of these stories and grounding everything in the real terror of mental health struggles. And as we know today, mental health was something largely unspoken about in previous generations. So the idea that nobody thought to send Walter to therapy, for example, it's not that far-fetched. He was just a troubled kid. But in his day, that was often where things ended. It was easier to just say that and far more acceptable than to actually seek help for the boy. It just adds to the tragedy of this family to realize how many of their troubles were rooted in something as serious as mental illness and nothing was done. There was no help for this family when there really should have been. Living with depression myself, I get how it feels to want to be something other than me. I can understand Lewis here. I can even understand how the same issues could have led to such a profound impact on Edie. She witnessed so much death, and it was probably easier to believe and sometimes create fantastic stories of a curse and of these otherworldly forces working against the family than to actually address the real issues, especially in a time when the real issues were things that we weren't supposed to even talk about. But from here, it's time to get to the final story. But it had to end one way or another. All that's left now is to tell you about that last night. Edith tells us about the night that they left. Dawn knew that she and Edith had to get away. She made plans for her grandma Edie to go to a nursing home and started packing away all their belongings. To our final night together and all our final nights apart. Their last night together in the house, a massive fight was started between Dawn and Edie, as young Edith was sent off to the library to read a book that was given to her by Edie. The intensity of the situation is heartbreaking. They're all still reeling from the death of Lewis at this point. Edith has a right to know these stories. My children are dead because of your stories. Edie's story talks about the night that Edith was born. She tells about walking out at low tide to her father's house. It's a surreal story, but just as she is about to uncover some deep truth, some great reveal. But that I need you to try and- Edith, what are you doing in here? It's mine. Edith. Mom, you're gonna rip it, let go. Dawn storms in and interrupts. The book is torn and Edith and Dawn leave, with Edith's last visual of her great-grandma as seeing her out on the porch as they pull away. It's an unfortunate, depressing end to that bit of the story. We never find out what Edie was going to tell us. Edith never made her way back into the library on her return visit, and I still wonder why. I mean, that's bothered me for a long time, but I think... She knew that whatever the story was, it was just a story. She got better for a while, and then she didn't. And then I was alone. The last finch left alive. until I found out about you. The actual story comes to a close with Edith talking to her unborn son, writing about how she just wanted to meet him 
and tell him all of this herself. But in a dark twist, she adds that if he's reading this, things must not have worked out. That reveal is one of the saddest of the entire story. Edith dies in childbirth. This is where your story begins. I'm sorry I won't be there to see it. It's a lot to ask, but I don't want you to be sad that I'm gone. I want you to be amazed that any of us ever had a chance to be here at all. Good luck. Her son is the character on the boat. He's going back to the family home, his family home, to visit his mom's grave. The family curse may or may not be real in this game. Her son Christopher may or may not be the next victim of the curse. He's already wearing a cast, showing that he's accident prone just like the rest of the family. But there's hope here. A hope that this story doesn't have to end in sadness. We're left with that hope, and as the credits roll, it's hard not to look into myself as well as my own family, my own issues, and realize Edith is right. I don't have any big closing statements here. Edith Finch is one of my all-time favorite video games because it has impacted me in a totally unique way from any other form of media that I've ever encountered. If you've made it this far in the video, I sincerely thank you for sticking with me. I'm the Unhinged Gamer, and I look forward to seeing you again in the next one. Please take care of yourself.